Ladies and gentlemen, I was expressing my gratitude for being part of this celebration, not just of the donation of the archive, but maybe even more so, a celebration of the tremendous contribution which Brendan made. If I don't dwell on it, it is first of all because it has been described with great eloquence and great personal authority by Michael Oatley, who, and I don't have that degree of personal authority, but I'm happy to echo everything that Michael said. That being said, I probably have to disappoint the audience in two respects. One is there are no Higgin papers, at least not of the kind that I can give to anyone. And the reason for that might surprise some here, because when the peace process has been the success it is, I think there's an inevitable tendency to assume that it was vowed to success from the very beginning. In fact, those of us involved in it, particularly perhaps from a, an, the Irish administration, knew that it was very dangerous and uncharted territory, and we hoped it would end in success. But we were equally alive to the idea it might end before a tribunal of inquiry, where I would be, as they say, a person of interest. And I wanted to swear truthfully that the papers I had in relation to this were all in the archive of the Department of Foreign Affairs. There was the added consideration, I suppose, that we read that some of Michael's friends were so diabolically clever that even a single electron was like Xeroxing the, the whole file. So where discretion was particularly important, we felt it prudent to avoid those electrons. And I suppose the final point I would make, it was a busy time and we didn't have time to lay down love letters to posterity, show how clever we all were at the time. So no Higgin papers. The second point I must disappoint is that I don't believe there is an enormous read across from one peace process to another. There are, of course, very general principles you can deduce. I think Tony Blair's memoir contains a chapter, or maybe recycles a memo, that gives a, a reasonable summary of what they might be. But they're all at the level of generality. I think if you descend as it were, into the nitty-gritty. I'm reminded of what Tolstoy said about happy and unhappy families, that all happy families are alike, and each unhappy family is different in its own way. And I think the key to a peace process is not applying some template where you think this must be stage five and stage six follows. It is effectively, borrowing Tolstoy, try to trace the particular unhappiness of that particular family and trying, to, and trying to redress that. I was involved in a, in a sort of senior official capacity between 1987 in the Maryfield Bunker, as it was called, and then after a short interlude in Denmark, I was called back somewhat to my chagrin, I might as well admit, to head up the Anglo-Irish Division of the Department of Foreign Affairs. So that was between 87 until I left for Washington in 97. And that, that was a time, obviously, of very fundamental change in Irish government policy. And I suppose the question is, why did that come about? If I had to pick only one cause, in two words, it would be John Hume. Only Hume, I think, had the superb political instincts to see opportunities in a landscape that looked very bleak to most other people. And especially, only Hume had the moral authority to persuade the public in the South and the political cadre in the South to follow what they saw as a very strange and paradoxical uh, path. But that wasn't the whole explanation because John had had many ideas in the course of his career that he'd put to Dublin and where, as the phrase goes, let in one ear and out the other. Why was this different? Two reasons, I think. One was the goal of peace was so transcendent. Even if it were possible to suppress violence, through military means, 
the cost in treasure, civil liberties was enormous, that the idea of a peaceful alternative, a voluntary alternative, was a very glittering prize. And I think the second reason was that so many things had failed in Northern Ireland. And maybe I'd take a little time in examining why it was at that stage we thought things might be different. When I was in Denmark preparing for my new assignment, I remember sitting down at one stage and doing a kind of a catalogue of errors that we had in relation to Northern Ireland. I think the first one was that the problem was insoluble. And I always thought that was just Irish narcissism because we had a difficult problem. It, mu it must be a world-class impossible problem. But when you looked at it, the land thefts were three or four hundred years old. The, there were no outside powers stoking the fires or fishing in troubled waters as you had in other conflict zones. The cultural differences between the two sides were so close that many people doubted, many outsiders certainly doubted, whether they existed at all. And finally, insofar as religious differences went, they were in the hands of leaders who, with a couple of maybe honest exceptions, embraced fraternally and incessantly in the name of the Lord. So what was, what was so insoluble about all of that? The second fallacy <coughs> was one that Michael touched on, that the men of violence were from Mars or alternatively were psychopaths. Now, I've met a small minority. By the way, men of violence was the term of art at that time, which <coughs> gave women a, a quite undeserved free pass in this department as far as I could see. But at any rate, the idea that, as I said, I met a few that qualified maybe on one or both counts, if not, if not Mars, at least wired to the moon in the great Northern Ireland phrase. But the vast majority had their influence and importance, not for some psychiatric reason, but because they were emanations of a significant community. I mean, crime is a, and is a crime is a crime is very satisfyingly consistent and straightforward but it elides so many factors that it closes the door pretty much on, on progress. A kind of a related fallacy was the men of violence would never compromise. And that was to some extent cultivated by the Republicans themselves and was a, a kind of a source of some strength in that it gave them the reputation of being adamantine. But it also closed and closed from the inside many possibilities that, um, for progress that would otherwise have existed. So the two things were, as it were, mirror images of each other. And that is where the process of dialogue, the, the, the dripping on the stone, if you like, uh, which Brendan had such a key role in, was so, so incredibly important. I think the biggest fallacy was that a solution could only be found by the moderates isolating the extremists. And that there are still many people of goodwill who had that difficulty with the peace process even yet, that it departed from that principle. And I understand them, but the problem with the principle was that more than a generation of experience in Northern Ireland proved it was not going to work. And it was not going to work for one very simple reason, which is the moderates on both sides feared their own extremists much more than they trusted the moderates on the other side. In other words, they were continually being asked to launch the trapeze and told they would be caught. But in fact, they had a rational expectation that they wouldn't be caught, not, never mind the people who might be sawing the rope from above. So it was, it was a, a good idea, but it, it, it simply wouldn't work. On a personal note, I always thought moderate was not a scientific description, but a name the press gave to people that they approved of. Because one of the very edifying things I remember after the ceasefires the number of so-called moderates, who had obviously been moderate on condition there was a very, a very mean dog in the backyard. And once the dog stopped snarling, very many of them discovered their inner extremists. So as I said, I've always been very skeptical about that particular division. I suppose the final thing that I thought was very dubious was the idea that Northern Ireland people were compulsively sectarian, and what could, what could a poor referee do, so to speak? I always thought that was profoundly mistaken. There are, of course, 
terribly sectarian currents still in Northern Ireland. But the, the vast majority of people, the sectarianism was a context that they were born into, and they had to observe for reasons simply of self-defense. The penalty was ostracism, maybe even death, if, if you got it wrong. And I always believed, and I think this will be proved by the peace process, that the people of Northern Ireland would be profoundly grateful to have this miasma lifted for them, and I, which I hope the peace process uh, will achieve and indeed prove. I think the other point worth mentioning, the people of Northern Ireland had not determined their own environment. That was the, that was the, the uh, result of unfinished business between Dublin and London for short hand. And in that sense, they not only suffered the context, but they genuinely had to be absolved to a very considerable extent from being the decisive creators of that context. As for the referee, um, I think the, the idea that they could only be refereed by an adult, I, said, I think was profoundly insulting. I think the referee was a simple, a symptom rather, of the profound degree of denial that was right across the spectrum. Every single participant, every single protagonist was in a state of denial to varying degrees. And I think, and this is simply a reflection, that the British government were absolutely the linchpin and by a, a huge extent the most important protagonist in the whole equation. And therefore, the denial by the British government was a particularly uh, damaging uh, uh, circumstance. And one of the conditions of success was that that denial had to be lifted. It was a great triumph of British diplomacy that they managed to persuade so many people that they were merely the referees. And rather, if Abramovich talked out to re referee a Chelsea match and everybody was convinced that he would have only the most sublime and objective uh, application of the rules of football in his decisions. It, in other words, there was a little bit of conflict there. But I could go on a long time, and I don't have the time, about the degree of denial on each side. But the great thing that happened in the peace process was that the protagonists reciprocally took each other out of denial. And that, I think, uh, has led to the situation where we now are. The there were some challenges we faced that I think are not appreciated simply because they were successfully overcome. One of them had to do with the question of language. We were very concerned at the outset to make sure that the kind of theological disputes that envenomed the Irish Civil War should not trammel the peace process. And the result of with a great deal of help from uh, very outstanding um, British counterparts, we managed to create language that, if it didn't fully comprehend, at least reflected to some extent, the position of all protagonists. It happened very often at very considerable cost to the English language. I used to say we might dream about a Nobel Peace Prize, but never the prize for literature. But it did mean that these um, awkward theoretical packages that we, that we drafted at that time were respectfully sealed in packages. The packages were respectfully passed on from one stage of the negotiation to the other and never opened. And that meant that the negotiations could concentrate on the pragmatic end, which was as it, it should have been. We were also concerned to refine the language in other sense. The process had been going on, the process of negotiation had been going on for a very long time, and many of the concepts had got outworn, and not for a love of jargon, but simply to renew them or maybe to refine them. We were at pains to, to, to broaden that. I mean, if you take the concept of equality, for example, we tried to substitute that for the awkward phase of parity of esteem. Again, not for jargon's sake, but because there was a difference. My British colleagues used to groan when I used, quoted the great philosopher, the, 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 the gunslinger Bat Masterson, who in 1921 said, if you take equality, the rich and the poor have the same amount of ice. The rich get it in summer, the poor get it in winter. And I think it was an example of how concepts are not always as flexible as they like. Where are we now? I think 
an incredible amount has been achieved. I think when the art of politics, like so many other institutions in the country, are devalued, it's good to remember that the art of politics, using that from the private citizen like Brendan, right up to the prime ministers, the art of politics collectively has delivered, has bookended the question of political violence that began at the beginning of the 20th century. And I think, we'll have, I hope, will have ended at the end of the 21st century. And I must say that all of the, in all of that time, I cannot think of a single individual I came across who abused the peace process for any kind of a purely selfish or unworthy motion, uh, motives. It really did reflect great credit, I think, on all of the protagonists. It would be very foolish, a very foolish opt optimist that would say we have seen the last death from political violence in Northern Ireland. It's obviously too easy for anyone who wants to kill indiscriminately. Uh, it's too difficult, I should say, uh, to prevent them. But I think if these things happen again, and one can hope that they won't, but if they do, the personal tragedy will be as keen for the individuals as it always was. But I think it will not develop into a tragedy for the whole community, as happened in the past. I think also we have to be realistic about what the need for time. I think as long as structures are seen as unjust, it's a waste of time trying to change attitudes because the public will not get beyond the big elephant in the room of the unacceptable structures. Once we get structures that are reasonably acceptable, and I hope we have those in relation to the situation now, then attitudes begin to change. But that takes typically a generation or so beyond what one might ex uh, expect. There are still lots of signs, depressing signs of the old way of thinking. But it's also fair to say there are a lot of very inspiring signs that the change of attitudes I'm talking about, and that I think realistically has to be given a generation, may actually, in a very benign way, fast forward a bit. And um, if I had to draw up a balance sheet, I would say I see much more shoots of the positive new attitudes than I see dead wood from the old ones. So again, paying tribute to Brendan and echoing the eloquent, eloquent words from the different perspectives, of uh, Michael and Paul, I want to add, we didn't overlap in a, in a direct sense, although his work was known to me, but um, I want to say that uh, the achievement of peace, we hope, like in St. Paul's Cathedral, that if he, his children want to see his monument, they can say, look around you. Thank you.